Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Unizor Education. Um, today I would like to talk again about heat and the temperature. It's kind of related to each other um, concepts, but there are lots of differences and that's what we're going to talk uh, today about. Now, this lecture is part of the course called Physics 14 presented on Unizor.com. Unizor uh, it's, it's a course, which means it has many lectures logically related uh, to each other in logical sequence, in logical order, and all these lectures on the website have their uh, textual uh, equivalent, so you can basically read it like a textbook as well as uh, listening to the lecture. And also the website has lots of problems, exams, etc. The um, website is completely free. Uh, there are no even advertisements, no strings attached at all. And I do recommend you, if you found this lecture somewhere else, like on YouTube, for instance, I still recommend you to go to unizor.com and listen to this lecture from the website because it gives you, again, the text. And also there are preceding lectures, following lectures, etc. The website also contains a prerequisite course, which is called Math for Teens. Obviously, math is uh, absolutely necessary for physics. So, let's talk about heat and temperature. Well, again, we all kind of know, intuitively know what these things are, but let's be very precise, more like scientific in this particular case. We know what heat actually is. Heat is an, a form of energy. So, whatever the amount of energy is supplied to a body, it's basically converted into kinetic energy of its molecular movements. Now, what is the temperature? Well, temperature is, as we have already established in the previous lectures, it's an average kinetic uh, energy of the particular um, molecules of this, of this object. Let me make a comparison. Uh, let's say you have two different cars and you have certain amount of fuel, the same. We put the same amount of fuel into one and to another. But the cars are different. Now, they start moving and you press the pedal to, to, to the metal in both cases. Most likely, they will um, go with different speeds. So the speed of the car is like a speed of individual molecules or average speed of the molecules. Amount of fuel is total amount of energy. How you uh, convert the total amount of energy which you supply to the body into exact kinetic energy of its molecules, well, depends on what exactly this particular object is con consists of. I mean, different um, materials behave differently when the same amount of energy is supplied to them. Let's say you have certain amount of heat or energy which you supply to one gram of water uh, and it increases its temperature by one degree. Now, you have exactly the same amount of heat and you apply it to some other material, not the water, but let's say copper. It will also increase the temperature, so the movement of uh, individual molecules will definitely increase. But will it increase in the same way, I mean, the temperature will be exactly the same. It will increase the temperature of the water by one degree, but will it increase by one degree temperature of the um, copper? Well, no. Actually, it's much more. And here is why. And it's very important. Every material has its own capacity of converting energy which is supplied to it into a kinetic energy of the molecules. And therefore, different materials react differently as far as their temperature is increasing by the same amount of energy supplied, the same amount, the same amount of heat supplied. And it actually depends on, on the quality of the material, what, what this particular object is made of. It doesn't depend on any other uh, qualities. So, experimentally, it was established that 
certain amount, certain amount of heat will increase um, certain amount of material by certain amount of degrees of Celsius, let's say. And it depends basically only on the quality of the material. So, you have, let's say, one kilogram of material, and let's say you want to increase it by one degree Celsius, or Kelvin. Let's, talk, let, let's use Kelvin. It certainly requires a certain amount of heat to do this, to increase the temperature of one kilogram of material by one degree. And this amount of heat, amount of energy which you should supply to this one kilogram, is different for different uh, materials. But for the same material, it actually doesn't depend on anything else. It depends only on the mass and by how much we want to increase the temperature from 50 to 51 degree or from 20 to 21 uh, it's exactly the same amount of energy it was established experimentally and for each particular object for each particular material the object is made of the amount of energy needed to increase one kilogram by the temperature of by, 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 by one degree it's called a specific I call the specific heat capacity. So that's very, very important. Every material, and that's not only the uh, solid material, it's also the water or, and, and gases, whatever. As long as you know the mass of this object made of this material, and you know that you want to establish uh, you want to increase the temperature by a certain number of degrees. That is sufficient, actually, uh, to find out how much heat you need for this. Because mass is additive, so if you want 2 kilograms, it will be twice as much heat. And it, 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 if it's not from 20 to 21, but from 20 to 22, that basically means from 20 to 21 by 1 degree, and from 20, 21 to 22. So again, you double. Temperature is also kind of an additive thing. So if you have mass of an object and you have certain amount of certain degrees you would like to increase uh, uh, the temperature, if you multiply this by a certain constant which is specific for this material, you will get amount of energy needed for this particular delta T how much additional energy you need to uh, supply to this mass to increase by uh, this number of degrees and this is a specific for material and it's different for different material and by the way we already know that one kilogram of water if you want to increase by one um, degree of uh, uh, one degree of kelvins you need um, 1000 calories right because it's a kilogram not gram gram is one calorie kilogram is 1000 kil uh, calories kilocalorie and we know that this is equal to 1 h4 joules so this is a specific heat capacity of the water now just as an example specific heat capacity of i have certain examples so this is the water now, copper has specific heat 385 joules. So, one kilogram of copper to increase the temperature by one degree of Kelvin scale, you need 385 joules. By the way, look at this. It's more than 10 times less. So, the water requires more energy to increase a kilogram of water by one degree than copper. Now, what else do I have? I have gold. One twenty-nine. Even less. Still, one kilogram, one kilogram, one kilogram. One degree, one degree, one degree increase. 
it needs this amount of energy. Now I have uranium. Uranium has 116 joules. And then I have a hydrogen. Hydrogen has 14,304 joules heat capacity. So if you see there is some kind of a dependency. Um, this is the fluid, this is the gas. These are all solids, but this one is um, uh, it, it, it's heavier. Uranium is much heavier than gold. Gold is heavier than, than copper, right? So it looks like the more dense uh, the matter is, because this is the most dense, the kilogram of uranium takes much less space than the gold. Gold has ma much space than the copper. Obviously, copper has much less space than water, and water has much less space one kilogram of water much less space takes than one kilogram of uh, hydrogen. So, as you see, it kind of depend, depends, it, it depends on the, on the density of the material. So the more dense material is, less uh, energy it requires to increase its temperature by a certain amount of um, degrees. Okay, now being as it may, let's examine a little bit further. Now, if you look at this only, you can actually graph it. You can have a dependency. Now, delta T depends, delta E divided by C times M. This is the same thing. So either you express energy um, or heat, if you wish, as um, amount which depends on how much temperature we want to increase, or given the energy, you can get um, the degrees, the temperature grows. So amount of energy can be converted into increase of the temperature. Amount, uh, the needed increase of temperature requires certain energy. So let's do it graphically. Let's say you have here heat which is supplied and the temperature, uh, growth of the temperature. So, so Q is argument, uh, heat, and T is uh, the function. Uh, so I'll use this one. Well, obviously it's a proportional dependency where C times M, uh, specific heat capacity times mass is uh, some kind of a factor. So you will have something like this graph, right? Now, now let's talk about uh, melting ice. That's very important. As you know, we have different state of states of matter: ice, water, um, gold, and we can basically melt the gold. Um, hydrogen. Uh, we can freeze the hydrogen into liquid hydrogen. So we have different states. So let's see what happens when we are gradually heating, let's say, the frozen water, which is ice, um, into temperature beyond zero Celsius, beyond the uh, melting point. What happens in this case? Okay, so in the beginning, we have ice. This is ice. This is zero temperature of Celsius. Okay, so as ice being gradually heated, we have this proportional kind of dependency of the increase of the temperature as the function of uh, amount of heat supplied. What happens around zero Celsius? Well, the ice begins melting. Here is a very interesting thing. Uh, ice has capacity, a specific heat capacity, 2090. 
and uh, water, as we know, has 4184. That's very interesting. It means that to increase the temperature by one degree, if it's an ice, if it's a one kilogram of ice, you need 2090 joules of energy. But if it's water, it needs significantly more, like twice as much. So what happens when we are reaching the point of zero, the point of melting? Well, ice begins melting, but it doesn't really melt immediately. It gradually melts. Now, as we supply um, heat to the melting ice, well, there is certain water and certain amount of ice, right? So the water actually is mixed with ice and we do supply water, uh, we do supply a certain amount of heat uh, to, to this mix of ice and water. But what happens? Well, water touches the ice, ice cools the water, water heats the ice, so the melting continues, but unless it's complete, the temperature will still be the temperature of the ice and melting ice and, and have frozen water, which is around zero. So what I mean is, as we are increasing the amount of heat which we are basically supplying, our temperature remains the same up until the point so this is melting point. Up until the point when everything is melted, the com complete ice is melted, then we have a different coefficient between uh, uh, amount of heat and uh, growth of the temperature. We need actually a little bit more heat to get to the same uh, difference. So this is water. So this is below temperature is below zero when everything is ice. Now at zero, so we are increasing the heat proportional, let's say, to time or something like this. Uh, and, and our temperature of the ice grows, but when it starts melting, we are still increasing our uh, amount of uh, heat which are supplying into this uh, mix of uh, ice and water. But the temperature of the mix remains the same until it's completely melted and then it continues grows but at a different coefficient so this coefficient relates to this specific uh, heat and this coefficient relates to this specific heat so it's different proportion mass is the same one kilogram one kilogram but the coefficient is different that's why we have this is a little bit steeper than this one so this is a very interesting observation that change of state from, let's say, um, solid to, to liquid, or the same thing from liquid to gas, uh, requires certain amount of additional energy just to convert uh, the state from, sto from solid to liquid. So, state conversion, or state transformation rather, probably better, better word, state transformation requires additional energy and not a small amount of energy by the way in the case of ice melting into water one kilogram of melting requires three 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 thousand joules you see to increase by one degree the temperature of the ice you need two thousand something joules but to convert one kilogram from ice to melt it when it's when it's already reached zero temperature just to melt it requires so much energy so change of state is a very important and very heat consuming process the melting in this particular case now um i have to tell that there is a reverse let's say you're freezing the water into ice. Now, for this, you need to extract the heat from the, from the water. You have to cool it down. 
so you need something like a refrigeration or whatever which takes the energy from the water and somehow converts it or disposes it uh, in, into some kind of condenser or whatever it is how refrigerators are are, um, are, are made so again to, to keep something to, to freeze something you need to extract certain amount of heat which is exactly equal to amount of heat you need to supply to make a different to, to make a reverse transformation so you need certain amount of heat to supply to ice to convert into water and you need to extract exactly the same amount of heat to convert water into ice so this is a very important concept of how the heat and temperature are related as long as we don't change the state as long as the state is not transformed if it's a solid it's a solid then you have basically a proportional dependency between amount of heat and uh, and the temperature you increase the amount of heat and the temperature is proportionally growing and this is basically all. as soon as you reach the point of state transformation then you will have this horizontal um, line which indicates that you are supplying the heat in this case and the melting is basically going on the transformation of the state is going on and it requires a lot of energy actually let's just think about if you increase the temperature of ice let's say from minus I don't know from minus 50 let's say to zero you need 50 times this which is about what a hundred thousand right 50 times 2000 that's about a hundred thousand then after you have reached the temperature of zero from minus 50 which is a lot uh, of Celsius to zero that's 50 degrees you have to spend about a hundred thousand joules then to melt this kilogram of ice you need three times as much and then you uh, have to increase the temperature let's say again to 50 degrees of plus 50 degrees Celsius that requires 50 times 4000 more than 2 200 still less than to melt so melting is a very um, energy consuming process so that's how you have to really understand it's very very important change of state is really very much energy uh, consuming process uh, and there are just two words which I just wanted to say uh, I usually I, I don't think you will ever use these words but there is a scientific terminology this process of melting requires uh, additional energy so the process of melting therefore is called endothermic which means it's consuming energy if the reverse process let's say we are freezing the water so we are so the energy flows from the water outside refrigerator whatever it's called exothermic so endothermic is the process which consumes energy exothermic exothermic process is the one when energy is flowing outside well that's basically it i that's that's all i wanted to talk about the dependency between heat and uh, temperature today i do recommend you to read uh, the text information for this lecture on unizor.com you have to go to the um, chapter called energy and then there is a sub chapter heat and heat uh, and temperature um, paragraph okay that's it for today thank you very much and good luck